you'll turn your Bibles with me to John, the fifth chapter. John, the fifth chapter. Jesus is God's answer to man's disability. Jesus is God's answer to man's disability. We're looking at uh, one of the seven miracles in the book of John in the fifth chapter. We've looked at several already, and today we're going to look at one more. Starting in the fifth chapter of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, verse 1, the fifth chapter. And after this, uh, the, uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went into Jerusalem. And now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these uh, lay a great multitude of impotent people, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water, verse 4. For the angel went down at the certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in that made the whole whatsoever disease he had, verse 5. And a certain man was there which had infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him, in verse 6, and knew he had been now for a long time in this case, he said to him, Will thou be made whole? Verse 7. And the impotent man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man whom the water is troubled to put me in the pool while I am coming. Another steppeth down before me. Jesus said to him, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately... The man was made whole and took up his bed and walked on the same day was the seventh, verse 10. And the Jews therefore said to him that uh, was cured, Is it the seventh day? Is it not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? And he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk, verse 12. And then asked they him, What man is that which saith unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that healed was not who it was for Jesus had conveyed himself away and a multitude being in that place verse 14 and after Jesus findeth him in the temple he said to him behold thou art made whole sin no more least a worse thing come to thee let us pray gracious heavenly father it's an honor to be here today and Lord I thank you for the opportunity to baptize today I thank you for the opportunity to commune with you tonight Lord, Jesus is God's answer to man's disability. Lord, we need to believe in the miracle, but we need to trust in Jesus. And Lord, I pray that today that we're those type of people that be ready and willing to say, Lord, we trust in you. And Lord, I pray that you'll just continue to bless us as we look at your word. May your word be a lamp at our feet and light to our path. And Lord, if there's one lost today, may these be the moments of salvation. If there's one today that needs to say, I'm distraught, may they find peace that only you can give. And so, Lord, I ask you to bless us here at Fairview as we seek your will in all that we do. So bless, use, and direct us now as we go further. Let us be careful to give you the glory, honor, and praise. And we praise your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is God's answer to man's disability. We are to believe in miracles, but we are to give our trust to Jesus. Now, why in the world, uh, uh, why in the world uh, would these seven miracles be here in the book of John? Well, the great interesting thing, John gives us the answer in the 20th chapter of John, verse 30 and 31, that reads like this. This is why these seven miracles in the book of John. It says, and many other signs um, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31, here's the reason why these seven miracles are in the book of uh, John. It says, but these are written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. See, that's the reason of the seven miracles of why they are written in the book of John, is to give us life. Is there anyone here today that wants life? Maybe I need to say that again. Is there anybody here today that wants life? You see, it says, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believing you might have life through his name. And so 
they are miracles with meaning. They are miracles with a message. They are a sign with significance. And so I want to tell you about a man. His name is Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson was the strongest man in the world, literally. If you met Paul, you would be surprised. He was five foot, uh, ten inches, ten and a half inches tall. He wasn't very tall. He weighed 375 pounds. His neck measured 23 and a half inches around. How would you like to buy a shirt for a man like that? But he had a 23-inch neck. He had a 22-and-a-half-inch upper arms. That means his arms were like coconuts. He had a 50-inch chest, which I have a 50-inch chest. is isn't because I'm weigh- lifting weights. It's because I'm fat. Uh, but 35 inches in the thighs. Many are not even uh, 35 inches in the waist, much less the thighs. He was 35 inches around on the thighs, 20 inches around on the calves. Now, Paul Anderson gave his testimony at events, and somebody asked him one time, he says, was there ever a time that you were 97-pound weakling? He said, yes, when I was four years old. He had incredible strength. Paul Anderson, back in 1955, went to Moscow. He went over there to Russia. He was virtually unheard of. The Russians had, had all the titles for powerlifting in the world. But Paul beat them all. He beat each and every one of them. He was astounded, and they were astounded that he won the world championship in weightlifting. And the Russian announcer said this about him, said that he was a wonder of nature. Uh, later on, Paul began to do these feats at churches. He had a, not only was he a stellar athlete, he was a stellar Christian. He loved the Lord Jesus Christ. But back when he used to do these feasts at different churches, in occasion, he would pick up 6,270 pounds with his back. Now, my friends, if you don't know how many pounds that is, that's three tons. That's more than three tons that he picked up with his body. This man lifted that weight with his own body. He is in the 1985 Guinness World Record books. According to them, it says that he is the greatest weightlifter uh, that ever lifted pound, th- that many pounds by, by being a human. So now, my friends, listen to me. Paul Anderson was that from Valdosta, Georgia. Today, there is still uh, Paul Anderson home for boys between the age of 16 and 21. And Paul Anderson was a super, superhuman. He was the strongest man in the world, but he died. The strongest man in the world, but he died. How in the world can the strongest man die? Because he had failure kidney, kidney failure. He died at the age of 61. The strongest man in the world, but he died. Now, my friends, and if Jesus doesn't come, and you're sitting here under the sound of my voice, listen to me very closely, you're going to die. You say, no, I'm not. I'm a believer. But, folks, your body is going to die. So no matter how much, how strong you are, it doesn't matter. You're going to die. So I ask you today, who here wants life? Matter of fact, Romans, uh, or it shares with me in the Word of God that... Uh, The Bible says in uh, Isaiah 40, verse 30, it says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young shall be utterly fall. That's us, folks. We're going to fall. All human strength will utterly fail. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 14, 6, it says, Though our outward man perish, our inward man, the real man, is renewed day by day by the Lord Jesus Christ. So the greatest question that I ask today is not what's going to happen to our bodies, but the greatest question that I ask today, do you have the inner strength that God wants you to have? Do you have the inner strength knowing that your body's going to die and it's never going to be resurrected, but it will be resurrected when Jesus comes. But what I'm saying, it's gone. It will never be had. God's listen, when he resurrects you, he's going to give you a new body. He's not going to give you the old one. Praise God, I've wore this one out. But the miracle tells us how to have that inner strength. That's what this miracle's about. 
So the background is it took place at the pool of Bethesda. And literally, that means the house of mercy in Greek. It was by the sheep gate. And matter of fact, it was right by the sheep gate that, um, if I'm not mistaken, Stephen was stoned at. And so the pool is still there. It's about 40 feet below street level. Jesus showed his mercy at this pool. He showed his mercy to this poor man that had been laying there for 38 years. It was kind of like a health spa, if you would say. And it had porches all around. There were sick people. There's hundreds of sick people all around it. And yearly, when the water would bubble up, God, in his mercy, would heal the first person that got into the water. Now, Jesus came in the story because it was a feast day. And on that, and he went to that particular man. There were many there, but Jesus chose one. He chose one. This man had been waiting for 38 years. He had been sick with palsy. He had been sick and paralyzed. He had been invalid for 38 years. And Jesus asked him a profound, simple question. And listen very closely to the profound question that he asked. He says, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be whole? Matter of fact, the Bible says, will thou be made whole? Now listen to me, friends and family, that if you realize today, he's not just asking that man, he's asking you today. Do you, Christian, do you person sitting in Fairview Baptist Church want to be made whole? He's asking us, he's asking you and I, do we want to be whole? Do we want to be what he wants us to be? And my friends, we've got to realize today that he will give us the power for living, that Jesus is God's answer to man's disability. And we all sitting here have disability. Jesus healed him physically only to give credibility to the spiritual miracle. That's the only reason that he healed him at all. Jesus did something they could see so they may understand something they don't see. And I pray that you understand that. There's three things that will help us with the power of living. And I pray that you'll use these, that you'll etch them upon your heart and say, if I'm going to have that inward strength that God desires for me to have, I want to be made whole. I don't want to be in pieces. I want to be whole with Christ. And I want Christ. Listen, the spiritual realm of God needs you to be whole, not partial. So Jesus is God's answer to man's disability. The first thing that I would tell you that I learn in this story, and I pray that you'll learn in this story, you must validate your weakness. You must validate your weakness. The first thing is you must validate your weakness. You must admit you're weak. Look at verse 5. It says, A certain man was there which had infirmity for 38 years. Now, this man represents us and human beings without the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what that man represents. You see, the problem with so many of us is we will not admit that we are spiritually paralyzed. We will not validate our weakness. The Bible says in Romans 5, 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And I'm thankful that my God died for me, yet when I was a sinner, he died that I may have life in him and have victory in Jesus. See, the Bible describes every man without Christ as being without strength. And today, if you don't know Jesus and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're sitting here and you have no strength. You're just like this impotent man that had been laying there for 38 years. The word impotent means without strength. Therefore, he becomes an illustration of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl without Jesus. Now, I had to think about this. You must validate your weakness. And I I had to think and ask myself some questions when I began to think about this man laying there for 38 years, not moving, not getting where he needs to go, not being and having the inner strength that God desired for him to have. Listen, the first thing that I thought about in this validate my weakness, what is the primary source of your weakness? How in the world can you heal yourself and allow God and Christ to heal you and take care of your disability if you don't know the primary source of your weakness? 
So we're talking about validating your weakness. Think about the primary source of your weakness. Where does your weakness come from? If you'll look back at verse 14, what was this man's problem? Look at it. And he says, Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said to him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest worse thing come unto you. Now, the primary source of this man's problem and his weakness was sin. Now, I'm not telling you that every man that's sick, it's because of sin. That's not what I'm telling you. But it is for this man in the story. I think that's the reason that Jesus picked this man out. Because of his sickness is because of sin. And it correlates and connects with what his primary source is. It, it just directly connects with what Christ is trying to say. So the point is, the primary source of weakness is sin. We are sinners by birth. We are sinners by nature. We are sinners by choice. We are sinners by practice. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you're listening to me and the sound of my voice now, I want you to realize we are all sinners and fell short of the glory of God. The primary source of our weakness in America, the primary source of our weakness in our churches, the primary source that's a weakness in our homes is sin, S-I-N. But the second thing that I thought about, we must validate my weakness. I must know what my sin is. What is my, my weakness is sin. But the second thing is the, pa the paralyzing force of weakness. What, it, what does it paralyze? You see, I want you to see the paralyzing force of this weakness, which is sin. Many of us don't realize that we are spiritually paralyzed. And people want to say, oh, I'm where I need to be. I go to church. Going to church does not make you spiritual in Jesus Christ. What makes you spiritual is when Jesus lives in you and you have a relationship with him. We don't need religion. We need a relationship with him. You may say, well, I'm not weak. I lift weights. I'm very strong. I'm not talking about physical weakness. My friends, you may say, well, well, I'm not weak. I got a PhD. I'm not talking about your intellect weakness. You may say, well, Brother Jeff, I am not weak. I have a million dollars in the bank. I am not talking about your financial weakness. I am talking about spiritual weakness that has paralyzed you. You see, spiritually, people are not where they need to be in America or in our lives. Well, I because of S-I-N, sin. You say, sin that not cause me to do anything. Well, then you're full of hogwash if you don't know what sin is. Because sin is what causes us. For he said in Romans 5, 6, he says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you know what our weakness is? Our weakness is that we don't have strength to be godly. We don't have strength to be godly. We're without strength. So Christ died for the ungodly. Isn't that what it says? You see what you need in life? What is God's plan for you? What does God desire for you? He wants you to be godly. He wants you to be godly. We don't have the strength to be godly. And somebody says, well, I'm godly. You are not godly. You cannot be godly on your own. There is nobody here that can be godly. Well, Brother Jeff, you don't know who I am. I don't care who you are. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 10, 23, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that he walketh to direct his steps. It's not in us to be holy. We can't be godly. The only way we can be godly is when Jesus dies on the cross and we accept that and have a relationship like Michael has done. And we're going to baptize him today because he believed that Jesus died, resurrected, and is alive. You see, you may be strong as you want, but you ain't as strong as you ought to be. While we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. But if you will, in that story, look at verse 5 and 6 again with me, and it says this, And a certain man was there. He had infirmity for 38 years. He says, and when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had uh, been now a long time in that case, he said to him, will thou be made whole? 
So now, my friends, not only do I need to know the source, which is sin, not only do I know, need to know the force of sin, the force of sin makes us where we are ungodly and we cannot accept him. That's why Jesus died. But thirdly, the persistent course of weakness. The primary source of sin, the paralyzing force of sin, is we cannot be godly. But notice, this man had been there how many years? 38 years. Is that not the persistent course of weakness? I mean, can you imagine a sick man paralyzed, impotent, without strength, laying there for 38 years? Some of you are laying there, and you've been laying longer than 38 years because you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, if you don't realize what happens when you're paralyzed for 38 years, just use some common sense and think about this. His muscles begin to waste away and wither. Every year this man was there, it got, didn't get better, it got worse. The longer that we don't serve Christ, the longer that we do not say, hey Christ, we need to validate our weakness. I can't do it, God. I need you. Sin is in the way and I cannot reach godliness without you, but I must realize the persistent course. You don't get better by putting off your relationship with Jesus. You, all you do is get worse, worse, and worse. Listen, his muscle tissue began to disintegrate. So it is with a man, woman, and boy without Christ. The longer that you live, the worse their condition becomes. That's why we as Fairview need to be busy saving people for Jesus Christ. That's the reason that no person should put off their heart, giving their heart to Jesus Christ. If you need to be saved, you ought to as soon as possible. Because tomorrow, you only have more sin to repent of and less time to repent in. So if you don't want to, what's this? If you don't want to have what this man had, laying there for 38 years, then you must validate your weakness. You must realize it's sin. You must realize that you can't be godly on your own. And you must realize that it is going to be a, a persistent course of weakness. You must be ready, ready to say, God... You're right. You're right, God. I am without strength. I will lay down my pride in the dust, and I must admit my need. That's what Michael did last week. He said, I have a need, and it cannot be met unless Christ lives in me. So when I read this miracle, this man's been laying there for 38 years. We must validate our weakness. But some of us, our pride gets in the way and we desperately wouldn't come to the altar because there's people that will not come to the altar because they're scared somebody may uh, uh, talk about their reputation or be concerned about them. Folks, I want you to realize something is that sin is dominating this world and it's keeping people from being what they ought to be and have inner strength. And today, I can tell you today, I want to be made whole. I want to say, God, you're right. I can't do it. I'm weak. I need you. I need to admit it and validate that weakness. But the second thing that I see in verse 6, listen to this. When Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been there a long time in this case. And he said to him, wilt thou be made whole? Now listen, not only must I validate my weakness, but I must activate my will. I must activate my will. Do you wish to be made whole? What's your, what's your uh, will in this matter? You must activate your will. God will never coerce you. And the problem is that we've had people walk down aisles that people have coerced them to come down the aisle. Folks, I want you to realize something is that God will enable your will, but God will not coerce your will. He will not make you do anything. If God were to coerce your will and your relationship with him was forced, you're a machine. And God can't have a relationship with a machine. If you want to come to Christ, you may, but if not, he'll not force you. The Bible says in Revelations 22, verse 17, whosoever will may come. So God, God has given you a will, and our Lord says, will you be made whole? He's asking us. Today, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be a follower of Christ? Do you want to be that person that has that inward peace in the midst of the struggles of life? See, God never made man to go to hell. 2 Peter 3, uh, 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 
Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is a sovereign God. I heard a, a story about a little 10-year-old boy, and he had heard a preacher say this. The preacher said this, and the little boy remembered it. He says, God created some people to be damned and go to hell. And God created some people to be saved and go to heaven. The little boy said this. He says, if God created me to go to hell, I want to go to hell because anything uh, that does what God created it do is happy. Now, you just think about that. You just think about that. Hell would cease to exist if God created us for hell. It would, it, would, it would cease to be. If you go to hell, then my friends, you're an intruder. Because the Bible says in Matthew 25, verse 41, it says hell was prepared for the devils and his angels. So we would be an intruder. God doesn't desire any of us to go to hell. He desires us to be in heaven with him and to worship him. Now, man have, uh, that... Um, have said yes, how would we have said yes if Jesus didn't take the initiative? We would have never said yes. Jesus took the initiative to get to know us. First John 4 verse 19 says we love him because he loved us. So many people want their, their sins to be erased. But they don't want to be made whole. And that's one of the things in the 21st century that I'll never get used to as a pastor. They don't want to truly, really be a full person as God intended them to be. What must you do if you were to have the purpose of living that Christ desires for you? You must validate your weakness, but you must activate your will. My will. You must say, Lord, I want you. Now, my friends, I don't know about you, but I want to say, yes, Lord, I want you bad. Folks, we need it more than any other time in history. One of the strangest stories that I, a very true story that I've read, it happened in 1829. George Wilson was sentenced uh, in the state of Pennsylvania to be hanged for mail robbery and murder. But Andrew Jackson, the president, at whatever reason I know not, but pardoned George Wilson. And he said, he is not to be hanged. He is not to be put to death. They took the, uh, the, the uh, pardon to the governor of the state, and then they took the, pa the pardon from the governor to the warden of the penitentiary where George Wilson was incarcerated. And, uh, now listen to this. And finally, they, del uh, they delivered it to George Wilson and said, the president of the United States has pardoned you. You will not hang. George Wilson said this, I refuse the pardon. I will not accept the pardon. I want to be hanged. They didn't know what to do. They have never had anybody refuse a pardon. So what did they do? They decided to uh, take that pardon to the United States Supreme Court of America. And the Supreme Court went back and forth. But finally, the Supreme Court studied that matter and talked about it. And this is what they decided. Chief Justice John Marshall said this, and I quote, A pardon is a piece of paper, the value which depends upon the acceptance by the person implicated. If it is refused, it is no pardon. As a result, George Wilson hung by the neck unto death, even though a pardon had been offered. Now you can sit in this auditorium today and die. You can go to hell when Jesus stretched out his, his arms and he says, will thou be made whole? The pardon is not good unless you validate it. And if you don't validate it, you refuse it. My friends, I'm coming to find out that this miracle is really saying something important. It's saying I must admit I'm weak. You know, the church... And the kingdom of Jesus Christ is the only organization that I know of besides hell's angels. You have to admit that you're bad to be received. So we've got to validate our weakness. But if we sit here and say, I've got it, I'm with it, make sure that you understand you ain't got it unless God's given it. And you validate and say, God, I am weak. 
and I admit it. And we've got to also, we've got to activate our will. That means we have to get up and say, yes, Lord, I, I, I'm tired of laying here for 38 years. I want to be made whole. I want to be whole with you in my heart and my life. But there's one last thing that I would tell you. And I find it in verse 7 through 9 of this very chapter, the fifth chapter of John, that says these very things. It says, the, uh, the impotent man answered him and sir. I have, uh, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked on the same day was the seventh. Now this is important. Validate. Activate your will. But you must initiate your walk. Initiate your walk. Remember the purpose of this miracle is to teach a greater spiritual lesson. Not that Jesus can heal a paralyzed man, but that Jesus can save a soul and give a person spiritual power to be godly. The miracle is that we receive supernatural strength from above. By believing in Jesus, we can walk in vitality, liberty, and also victory day by day. Jesus said to this man, rise up. Take up your bed. Keep that in mind because you must initiate your walk. What does the Bible say that Paul wrote in the church, in the church of Ephesus? He says, for by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Least any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. Them are three marvelous verses in the second chapter. And all three of them are built by three words, by, through, and unto. Now, I want to take those three words, and I want to wrap them around, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. When I do that, the first one is by grace. He... How was this man delivered? How did this man get up and walk? It was by grace. He didn't do anything to deserve it. He couldn't work his way there. He couldn't do what he needed to do. That means by grace. That means un, uh, uh, undeservable, it would be the word. Undeservable. He had favor of God and God gave it to him. And today, God wants to give you a gift. He wants to pardon you. He wants to make you whole. He says, hey, I want you to be a part of that church. There was nothing he could do. He was paralyzed, this man. The Bible says in, in John 5, 9, immediately he was made whole. Salvation is by sheer grace of God. If we're standing there and heard Jesus say, rise up and take, and it says, take your bed and walk. Isn't that what it says? Now, if we were standing there, you might say, that's not right to taunt that man. It's not right to, to uh, tell that man, and torment him by telling him to rise up, take up your bed, and walk. Some of us would even call Jesus cruel. How can you tell, tell a paralyzed man for 38 years to get up? If he could have got up, he would have already gotten up, right? That's what some of us would say. That's impossible, that's unreasonable, and that's unfair. That's how our world would see that today. That we're picking on this, this, this man that is impotent for 38 years, has been laying there. Jesus says, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. Some of us would say, hey, that's offensive because that's being cruel. You're tormenting that guy. But my friends, it is possible with Jesus. Mark 10, 27 says, for with him all things are possible. It's by grace. He was paralyzed. He said, rise. And that's what he says to every sinner. I want to save you supernaturally and transform you. He's saying, get up. Listen, Christianity is the impossible, the unreasonable, and Jesus Christ. Jesus does the impossible. He does the unreasonable. And my friends, he makes it possible because all things are possible with Jesus. Folks, he will save you supernaturally. He'll say, by grace, I give you this. Get up. 
Rise up. And today I encourage you, church, will you rise up? Will you get up? Or will you be the same you were when you first came in here? Or would you be ready and willing to say, God, I've got weaknesses. I can't be holy without you. And would you be ready and willing to say, God, I'm going to activate my will. I'm going to accept what you're offering. Folks, if we turn the pardon down, then it's no pardon at all. We've got to activate our will and say, God, we receive it. But lastly, we've got to initiate our walk. We're going to initiate our walk by grace. Not what we did, but what Christ did for us. And he freely gives us the gift. Folks, we need to rise up. But the problem is churches are not rising up. We, we sit there and we say there's no problem in our world. We cannot bury our head in the sand. The reality is our world is going to hell and Christians need to get right. And everybody says, no, I'm already made whole. No, you're not. You can't be without Jesus. So how am I taking these verses is by grace. God's grace for you and I. But when I think about initiating my walk, through faith. It's through faith. In verse 8, he says, take up your bed. Isn't that what he says? And the Lord says, take it up. Get it out of here. You don't need it anymore. Listen, faith is belief with legs on it. He says, not only am I telling you to get up, he says, take your bed and get it out of here. He says, take those old sins and throw them away. He says, throw them behind you because when I forgive you, they're gone. The slate is wiped clean and you never have to worry about them again. Is that not our Jesus? Take up your bed. He says, get it out of here. The problem is we've left our bed lying way too long, Christians. We've left our bed lying there. Let's take our sin and throw them away today and say, God, I'm going to live for you. Folks, we got to throw that sin away and not bring it up because if not, we're going to keep on going back to it. We're going to keep on going back to it. Folks, I'm tired of the past. I don't care what you've done in the past. I'm worried about what you're doing now for Jesus. Are you up and lastly, or secondly, are you doing it through faith? Do you have faith that God's going to let you be able to throw everything away and it's over? Because the Jesus I serve will. He's saying with his arms open wide, come throw it away. You see, we've, we don't throw things away anymore. My grandmother used to keep every butter tub that ever was. Y'all know anybody like that? Matter of fact, I heard a lady one time uh, at our church, and she knows who she is. There was a pot of coffee on over at the fellowship hall. She said, I ain't leaving that coffee there. I'm taking it home with me. She said, I don't leave anything. You see, that's the same way with Christ, isn't it? He says, take it up and get rid of it. Make it clean. But there's one last thing about Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. He says, he has made us not only by grace, but through faith. But what? unto good works Jesus says rise up take up your bed and do what walk walk now the word walk is a Greek verb that literally means a Greek in the Greek it means to walk and just keep on walking now isn't that the struggle in Christianity today we're not keeping on walking why is he walking and keep on walking is because, my friends, he is healed. Today, if you're healed, then, my friends, if you're healed, you'll be walking for Jesus. You'll be walking. He couldn't walk until he was up. He couldn't walk until he, he received the Christian life. And, folks, we can receive it because Colossians 2, 6 says, and as you've received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in him. Have you received him? Are you walking in him? We need Christians to stop refusing to walk in Jesus. And the last thing I tell you is, church, we need to stop. We need to get busy walking in Jesus. Stop worrying about what other people think about us or whatever other thoughts are. This man laid there for 38 years and Jesus healed him. I don't want what that man had for 38 years. I want to be made whole. And you're going to do it by grace, through faith. And you're going to do it by realizing under good works. Those good works is that we walk. And today I encourage you in your walk that if you're not walking like you're supposed to, if you don't have that inner strength that Jesus desires for each of us to have, you need to be at the altar and say, Jesus, I need it. 
Maybe there's a sin in your life and you need to say, Lord, I am ask forgiveness for that sin. Maybe today you've never received him. He's saying, he's knocking on your door and he's saying, let me in. You know, and I know that most Christians and most preachers herald all kinds of great things and all those things, but it is useless unless you receive it. Not my words, but the words of God. You see, stop laying in that rut. God's already given us a way to get out of that rut. And we need to get out of that rut. And maybe you've never received him. All you have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I want you. I need you. Help me. Forgive me. And let me become whole. Today he's asking us, do you want to be whole? And you'll find out most people don't want it. They want the forgiveness of sins, but they don't want to be made whole because they're worried they may have to do something. Folks, our Lord says, be whole and have that inner strength. How many of you have allowed struggles and trials to interrupt what you are because you're not whole in Jesus? Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, we're going to prepare our hearts to baptize here in just a moment. And Lord, but there's a time of invitation, a time that where people can respond to God's word. These were not my words, Lord. They were your words, simple words, words right there. And Lord, you said, have thine own way, Lord, in 294. Now, my friends, we've got to have God's way. God wants it his way. And he's saying to you before you leave here, whether if you're a visitor or a guest or a friend, now is the time. To get up, take up, and walk. Church, are we walking like we should? It's okay to say, Lord, I fall short. Would you be ready and willing to say that today to him? Not to me. Not to church, but to Jesus. Lord, you move this man in a way that we all can receive. And Lord, today I pray that Jesus is your answer to man's disability. And Lord, most of us don't want to admit that we have our disability. We don't want to lay our pride in the dirt and say, I don't have it right. Because other people may judge us. And Lord, if there's one that judges anybody about coming down this altar, they're wrong by judging. Because we're all sinners saved by grace. And so Lord, today I ask you, if there be one, let these be the moments. We ask you to bless, use, and strengthen us now. We pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're gonna